So uh, the topic is on creation, pr preserving, and uh, liberating the writer. Uh, so to start with, uh, tell us, you've been such a prolific writer. And what is nice about Anita Nair's writing is that she has refused to let herself bo be boxed into a genre. So there's nothing that she has not touched upon with the magic of her words. She has done fiction. She has done short stories, poetry, children's books, screenplay, and won an award for it, and uh, essays. So there is a wide genre of writing that Anita has attempted and very successfully done it too. Uh, so let me ask Anita, when did you fall in love with words? When did the writer was born in you? Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, I guess, you know, I, I, if there was one thing I was certain about in my life, right from the beginning, uh, was that I was just in love with words. For me, it was uh, a grand obsession. There was nothing else that made me as happy as when I was reading. And I guess for me, the, it was a natural fallout that from reading, um, at some point, I mean, as young as about seven, um, I decided that I wanted to write poetry. But um, obviously, at seven, what do you write about, you know? So it was pretty much a, a what fantasy. Did you, what did you write about? So it's very strange. It was about, um, I don't write fantasy now, but at that point, it was this fantastic poem about, um, uh, you know, sailing down the Nile. And strangely enough, the banks of the Nile had daffodils. So <laughs> that was high fantasy, I think. So the... the uh, I mean, I, I think probably because I don't come from a family of writers. I mean, there are a lot of fine artists in my family, but no writers at all. I, I, I mean, and absolutely no uh, connection with a written word in any sense. Um, I remember showing the poem to my mom and my brother, and they both looked at it and they said, oh, you wrote it. And I said, yes. And they said, write us another one, then we'll trust, you know, believe you. And that ended my, uh, <laughs> what should I say, um, public performance as a poet and um, I was a closeted writer for a very long time after that because it just meant to it was I thought obviously what I was writing was not uh, something that people understood you know so then I said why prove myself to anybody I would just keep it silent and I started writing for myself and I continue to do that even to this day you know so I keep thinking that I am my first reader not anybody else and uh, when did you decide to come out, so to speak, of as a writer? <laughs> so even that was an accident. So you know what used to happen was in the time, uh, I'm sure to many of the young people here, they can't even remember a time when you don't have internet. But um, when I had started writing, we didn't have internet. We just had these enormous computers and not many people could afford uh, to have printers in their homes. So uh, this was again the era of the floppy disk. Mm. So I would write my stories, I would put it into the floppy disk, take it to the office, and there I would take a printout. So I take a printout and just keep it for myself. So one day I forgot to take the printout back and I left it on my tabletop. And uh, the next morning I went to work and I went very early because I was nervous somebody would have laid their hands on it. And I'm horribly short-sighted. So, I, you know, typically even to this day, if I'm looking for something, I'll just go groping like this, you know. So I was groping for it. And there was this art director sitting next to me. I used to work in advertising. This art director sitting next to me and he said, is this what you're looking for? And he pulled out the sheaf of papers, the printout. And then I looked at him and said, did you read it? And he said, yes. And he said, um, can I give it to a friend of mine to read? And the friend of mine that he referred to uh, was this gentleman called Jayanth Kodkani, who used to be, at that point, an associate editor at the Times of India, Bangalore. And Jayanth became my first reader after that, you know, first external reader. To this day, anything that I write, Jayanth reads it first. And only then do I, you know, give it around. I mean, Jayanth and my editor, but nobody else. So Jayanth was the one who said, uh, why don't you write something? Why don't you have, do you have more short stories? I gave him the collection uh, to read and he said, have you thought of getting it published? And I said, do you think it's good enough? And he said, I think so. And so that is how my journey as a writer began. Was it published, Anita, the book that uh, you left in the giant read? Yes, I mean, that's again... That's the first it, one, is it? The yeah, market? that's the first collection. And in fact, again, 
um, I mean, it sounds a little bit like a fairy tale now when I see what people go through. So I had, uh, so I had no idea how. You know, this is again before uh, publishing was this big thing that it is now. So I had no idea how to even c connect with a, a publishing house. So I went to the bookstore, uh, looked at the books in alphabet, the Indian writing in alphabetical order. They had arranged it, and uh, I just looked at the first publishing house that I could find. Um, so I, it, it later, it was a joke with my editor when she was at Harper Collins that I found this publishing house called Har Anand, hmm. and Har Anand was before <laughs> Harper Collins. So I sent them three stories and uh, said, "Well, I have nine more stories, and if you're interested, do let me know." And in three weeks' time, I got a publishing contract. And then I didn't know what to do. I mean, this was like they're a small publisher. Do I stay with them or do I, you know, scout for other people? But ultimately, because I guess I was so insecure that I just decided to go with them. And that was my first book. Okay. And uh, that was a writer born, yes. a published writer. Yes. And uh, when you began with it, uh, like with many writers, are you still insecure as a writer and an author, as a storyteller? Absolutely, because I think, you know, each time I start on a book, I have no real idea how this book is going to develop. I mean, I have, I have all the, you know, the structure, the plot, the characters, everything in my mind. But there's something called the telling, the, the storytelling part of it, which is so dynamic. It changes. It's very organic. It changes on a daily basis as you're working on a book. And um, sometimes, uh, I mean, I, I finish a book and I think, oh my God, I've finished this. This was the nicest part, writing the book. But now that I am a published author, obviously there are readers and I'm constantly worried about how is this going to be received? And the thing is, like you mentioned, I've uh, refused to be boxed into a genre. So I'm reinventing myself as a writer with every new book. And there is no comfort zone for me to kind of fall back on and say, well, this is what I write and this is what my reader expects from me. I'm sure that my readers don't know what to expect from me anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, your latest book is interestingly, there's a part in Trivandrum as well. Yeah. Uh, your latest book that is based in, uh, she talks about the old Trivandrum of the 1960s. And there's a writer in it that she has referenced to. You'll have to read the book to re find out who she's writing about. But um, what was the research like that? Because you're talking about places you have not traveled to. You're talking about a period that none of us is really familiar with. So what is the kind of research and reference that go into your books? Because even if you look at it, uh, say, Cut Like Wound takes you to the dark underworld of Bangalore, uh, a, a field, a world that not many women would be familiar with unless you happen to be an activist or a social worker. So tell us something about the research that goes into your different books. Um, so, uh, I'll divide my research into uh, three parts. Um, one, of course, is what I derive from books and journals and the internet and so on, which is a lot of, there's a lot of information out there. Um, and it's like getting into a labyrinth, you know, you step into one room and then you're going into another room and finally you can get lost in this trail of research. That is one part of it. The second part of it is where I talk to people. For instance, when I have written um, the Trivandrum segment of uh, Eating Wasps, um, I was talking to um, a friend of mine who lives in Trivandrum and asking him to speak to people to find out what was it exactly like? What did they have there? What did they serve there? What was the library like? What was India Coffee House like? Where was it located? What was the distance? So all the questions are recreate the scene uh, by talking to people and getting information. And uh, again, with my crime procedurals, what I do is I talk to a lot of people about various things, uh, whether it's the police, whether it's NGOs, activists, um, or even people on the street and so on. The third part is where I actually research it myself. So, <clears throat> excuse me, in, um, in Cut Like Wound, for instance, um, there is this part of um, uh, a post-mortem. Mm. I actually did go to a post-mortem to check it out because there is, I mean, I've read countless accounts of it, but what does it make me feel? I don't know what it makes me feel. And uh, when I watch, you know, if you were to watch CSI or whatever, you see that it's so sanitized. It's nothing like what, is, what happens in India. It's very different. And, um, or wandering through 
the alleyways of Shivaji Nagar in, in Bangalore. I actually did it. I organized, you know, for a couple of boys to take me there. And we went in the middle of the night to see what it feels like. I mean, unless I can, um, you know, imbibe that atmosphere, allow it to soak into me, there is absolutely no way that I'm going to be able to bring in that amount of um, reality in, in my writing. So as a reader, I want the reader to be able to sense it, you know, absolutely. Not feel that it's a second-hand experience. I want them to feel that it's happening to them. So I need to do it myself. Um, Anita is uh, one of the very few writers who writes crime uh, fiction. Uh, so I was just asking her whether she would like to be called the female Agatha Christie. Uh, and uh, whether Inspector Gauda is another version, not another version actually, an Indian uh, inspired version of Hercules Pyro. Anita, what is your reaction to that? Um, so, um, are you, you know, a fan of Agatha no, Christie? No, I'm not. <laughs> For the reason that she writes what is called cozy crime. You know, it's all things that work out well and yeah, and it's very nice and there's nothing unsavory. Whereas for me, I, I write crime because I realize that with my literary fiction, I'm unable to make uh, social commentary. And for me, crime is a vehicle to make social commentary. There are things that I want to talk about which in literary fiction would become mind logs. And I don't want it just to be about the mind logs. I want it to be about what is happening around us. So which is why with Cut Like Wound, it was talking about corruption, it was talking about um, uh, transgender, how they're treated and so on. And uh, with Chain of Custody, it was about child trafficking. And I'm able to use crime as a, a platform to talk about things that bother me in our society. Uh, with my literary fiction, I think, you know, caught between lyricism and, um, you know, the character development and everything, somewhere the, the theme takes a beating. And crime allows me to address the theme in all its dimensions. Uh, since the topic is about creation of a writer and preserving the identity, so to speak of, you have never really preserved your identity. You want to experiment and you've tried to keep pushing the envelope all the time. You were established as a fiction writer, then you became a poet, then you started writing poetry. Then again, you wrote a screenplay. So it's as if you're trying to prove and say, look, I am really at home with words. And no matter what you do, I am, you know, I'll be here doing different things. Is that a kind of trying to prove to yourself or are you trying to the testing the boundaries of your creativity? What makes you try out all these different genres? Um, okay, the, again, two reasons. One, I'm a full-time writer. So as a full-time writer, if I were to just continue to write exactly the way I'm writing, I would bore myself stiff. And that would reflect in the writing that I do, which would become uh, complacent and it would also become predictable. And I think there's nothing more boring than a predictable writer. Uh, secondly, I think that, you know, I have constantly asked myself, what is the true meaning of artistic integrity? And artistic integrity for me is not about, uh, you know, being recognized by the literary establishment or being, you know, awarded this or having these many copies sold or whatever. For me, artistic integrity is about telling myself that I have pushed myself beyond my comfort zone. So for me, every book that I do is um, a challenge to my artistic integrity and I need to make sure that I go beyond what I'm comfortable with, what I'm familiar with and uh, try things that I would never have in a sane moment tried. <laughs> okay. And um, this seems a very trite question, but I must ask you this. Uh, many writers say that, you know, they have a time when they are at their creative best during the day and, you know, how they have to go and write during the time and all that. You are also a very passionate gardener. I've read that you're a very passionate cook and you're very house proud. Uh, so when among these mundane things within courts that a woman is supposed to do, where do you fit your writing in and where, where do you find the time for your research and writing and is there a particular time that you have to write where you can't do anything else? Something like that in a day? Um, so I am uh, very much a morning person. So I wake up quite early. So I do my what, writing. Like what time is So when I'm in the middle of a book, I would wake up at say about half past four okay, and work on from there. But it also means that by about 11 o'clock, I'm done for the day.
you know, I have nothing, no energy left for any creative, I mean, for creative writing more than anything else. Uh, so that leaves me the rest of the day to uh, do whatever else I want to do. And which is also the reason why if you were to ask me, I mean, again, it's this whole thing in the, of, you know, clocking my hours that I can't cook in the daytime. I can only cook in the evening because that's when I'm most comfortable cooking. I, because it's like I can't write in the evening and I can write only in the morning. And, um, and I guess, you know, 24 hours is quite adequate <laughs> for all these things. <laughs> you are also a collector of art and uh, you are also passionately interested in Kadagali. In fact, two of your books were, had revolved, one was entirely on Kadagali. One, even your latest book has uh, characters from your earlier books visiting it and talking about Kadagali and all that. What is your fascination with this? Uh, theatre form that's so intrinsic to most Malayalis and to Kerala? Uh, for me, I think uh, the, the love for Kadakali began with the Padams, you know, as, as a musical form for me. I used to love the, the singing more than anything else. I didn't understand a word of it until I started researching for Mistress and I spent some time at um, Kalamandalam, thanks to Mr. Kaladharan sitting there, <laughs> who uh, also connected me to this wonderful Ashan uh, called Gopalakrishnan, who is no more. And Gopalakrishnan, uh, Ashan was like um, a, um, a treasure house of knowledge, understanding. And again, in my mind, I always think of him as the first guru I had. You know, as someone who actually taught me the tutelage uh, of art, I would think. And uh, I, I then discovered that as I started reading the Atakadas and everything and Atapragarams and so on, that the characters, you know, typically in most Indian classical forms, you find that um, the characters uh, occupy either a dark space or a, you know, a space of light and radiance and everything. But for me as a writer, the most interesting part was that Kadakali stayed in the realm of grey. So you have uh, like uh, some, a character like Duryodhana, uh, who is considered as this epitome of evil, but there's this beautiful love scene between him and his wife. And uh, that was one of the most tender, or even Kichaka, in his Kichaka Vadam. You see that when he's, uh, you know, singing to uh, Sairandari, it's one of the most beautiful love poems you can think of. And in contrast, if you were to look at, say, um, Yudhishthira, uh, or one of the greats, you know, uh, or supposedly the Pachavashams, and they are absolutely horrible men. You know, and I think what I like about it is so the, the, the gods can be um, very vain. You can have de the demons who can, the asuras, who can be absolutely wonderful, tender human, human beings. So this realm of grave is what was so fascinating for me. And then everything about it. I like the rituals attached to it. I like, and I was, I'm reading something on Greek theater at this point. And I was just thinking about how it is, you know, with the Greek theater, they wear the mask. Uh, it's the same thing when in Kadakali artist, you know, he puts his scope on the thing on the head for those who don't know what it means. Um, there is a moment where you regress into yourself and the character takes over. They, in Greek theater, they call it the god taking over. In this, it's basically your character taking over. And there's so much of ritual attached to it, so much of uh, immersion or you know, sublimation of the self to become the character, which was a lesson for me in writing. So I, I think I have learned so much from Kadakali more than anything else. And that is now reflected in my writing, I think. So which is this obsession. Uh, you talked about um, actors in Kadagali becoming the characters. Uh, in that sense, your books, many of your books, and in your latest one, Eating Wolf, there are 10 characters, women. So do you, how do you get into the skin of these characters, these 10 women from different strata of life, different age groups, and each having her own story, you know, like, uh, but it's open-ended. You don't know what's happening to them, but for this last very... Um, what is it I would say a very uh, dark line that says the river is waiting mm? uh, so how do you live this character these 10 women uh, what is the process that you go through as a writer um, so again um, like I said uh, I, I mean I had a name for it after I had my tutelage of art with uh, Ashan 
But before that, uh, also I did the same thing. But it's basically I, what I call method writing. I have to become the character in my mind. There is no other way where I can be present as uh, Anita and write a character. I have to cease to be me. And I have to write it from the character's point of view. So for me, it is a lot of work. It's a huge um, psychological and emotional um, uh, duress that I have to go through when I write a book because I cease to exist as a person and uh, which is why also this early morning thing you know getting up early because my poor family otherwise have to live with this multiple personality that is flitting in and out of the house. So, uh, Manichitra Thada kind of a person in the house. Sorry? <laughs> Manichitra Thada kind <laughs> Absolutely. of Absolutely. <laughs> so, I have to then uh, become that character in my mind. And then at that point, I'm thinking like the character. I'm not thinking from my point of view. So, if, if in the new book, there is uh, a young child called uh, Megha. So, at one point, I'm being Megha. You know, what are the fears that Megha goes through? What are the frustrations that she goes through? What is what is she going through in her head is who I become. And in contrast, I would be writing about Sri Lakshmi, which is something else. Or I could be writing about Rupa, the diplomat's wife, which is another spectrum entirely. But each time, I have to become the character. So it is a huge, like I said, you know, you become that character in the Parana Bola. When I get into my uh, study and I start writing, um, I have to become that character. There's no other way. And again, I have learned these little rituals, which I take great pride in. So uh, before I start writing, like you light a lamp, um, um, I light a lamp and keep it because I need to do those ritualistic things to make sure that, you know, I'm able to step away from myself and be me. I mean, be this character and not be me. So I, I go through all that <laughs> and I need to, I mean, but it also needs to be backed by a lot of research. Like it's not enough being a character. I don't want it becoming um, a version of Anita. It should be if I'm writing about say Najma, this young girl, everything that Najma's life would have in terms of biographical details, in terms of her demographic, psychographic profile, everything I need to know. So that is where I, start off by creating my character, where I do like a bio data for them. And thereafter, I have to use that information to become that character. Uh, can I give a spoiler alert and say that who Sri Lakshmi is? Yeah. <laughs> Sri Lakshmi is based on this writer, Raja Lakshmi, who killed herself uh, in 1965 at the age of 35 or 36, uh, when she was at the peak of uh, success as a literary person. Uh, but there was a lot of heartbreak. There seems to have been a lot of heartbreak in her life. And uh, Anita's latest book explores that side of her psyche. Why did she kill herself? And that moment when she decides to take her life. One word is that we have a character in our mind. One word is that we have a character in our mind. What is the thing that we Each of us is tempted to think about her life. You know, that moment when she decides to take her life. Anita is very damaging. Because she is saying that she is very damaging. Liberation, but are you liberating that writer in you when you become the character? Or is it a different process? Um, okay, there is a small addendum to that. There is a small addendum to that addendum. This character is very loosely, very, very loosely based on Raja Lakshmi. Because if you go to Wikipedia, all you find is no information. No information. No information. No information. Which are basic four things that one, uh, she studied um, uh, at Banaras Hindu University. And secondly, that uh, she was a lecturer of, um, she was a lecturer of physics. And thirdly, that she killed herself. I mean, she was a successful writer. She won the Scythe Academy, the youngest person to win the Scythe Academy, Kerala Scythe Academy Award. And she killed herself. This is all I had. The rest of it is all speculative. So I wouldn't say that I have to be very clear about this, that it is not a recreation of her life. It is just a speculative uh, piece of writing about what could have happened to her, what may have happened to her. because. Uh, for those of you who don't know, she didn't leave a suicide note. So nobody knew what was the reason. And yet at the same time, um, I read um, a, a very wonderful report on her uh, after her death. It was something that a friend of mine here had sourced for me. And um, 
In it, it said that she'd actually left a note for her student telling her how the mark sheet should be looked at and stuff like that, but she didn't think of writing a suicide note. So that hit me, you know, that it wasn't that it was, yes, there was a moment of utter desperation, but there was also a moment of where she was completely sure what she was doing about. So I think in many ways, uh, when I write about a writer, there are questions that I ask myself. As a writer, I go into my own mind, I go into my own head. And at some point, I have to realize that, but I am not her. I am a different kind of a writer. So she has to, uh, again, not be me, but I have to be her. You know, if you get the yes. contrast. And I have to be her and see it through her eyes. What could have happened to her? What could have led her to taking her own life? And especially somebody who was supposed, who was so, you know, I think there was so much adulation for her. So it was not a question of um, failure in her, uh, you know, career. She was doing fairly well as a, you know, uh, I think as a professor, uh, as a lecturer. And um, um, yes, nobody knows about her personal life, what happened and so on. So I said, let me not just put it down to one single thing. Let me make it a compendium of multiple reasons. So which is why, again, it's like basically she's just saying I had enough more than anything else. Uh, in the Kaila Tipa Namal Noka and Anglo, a writer Nola Neleka, reward constraints on the writer. Namal only didn't be trolling on the Alangila Palapala Sanganal, Namada against Varam Nunda. Upon Anita Idan did him a self censorship on the Odo, Engine and Namal Edithari Nola Neleka, Idoka Namal factor it to Manasil Kaidumo, Yanivere, either Edia Chalapo, Nivere hurt Tava, Ingen Edia Chalapo, Eve Bath and Istapodomo, Anganaka Manasila Vararondo, Rikadhe than Idikimbo. Enki, I don't think I have self-censorship either when I write or speak, which is why I get trolled quite badly. But uh, I think no, I, I cannot do that because I am my own first writer, I mean reader, I am my own first reader. So when I read it, I need to feel like, okay, I have done justice to this. Because I'm putting my life into it. My, you know, I'm an emotional wreck when I finish a book uh, and a physical wreck. So at the end of it, I need to make sure that it has been worth it. I cannot play to the gallery. I cannot please people. I have to do what I think is artistically right. And that has been my credo right from the beginning. Uh, who are doing very well. Uh, social post attacking attacks face It's a whole range. Like women have to be extremely careful what they post on social media. Um, see, one thing I noticed is that uh, it's an again, I'm sorry to say this, but it's a very misogynistic thing to do, which is basically they think it really involves pride, the looks, the the body shaming, body shaming, slut shaming, that's why there's no discussion there. It's not saying like, look, I don't agree with your point of view. These are the reasons. There was a, you know, I was in uh, Kerala a couple of weeks ago in the Nartla. Uh, Shornoy school in the the so he says like, oh, uh, eight thousand award to get there, you. That gitta mandi tarna, I mean, attention seeking. Any kind of award, no matter. But I am entitled to my opinion, like 
he is entitled to his opinion. So I don't think that you know people should be trolled. What do you know about women uh, other than the one I mean, what do I know about women? I probably know more about women than many of them because I grew up in a time when I've stood in ration shops. I know all about living life from that level upwards, you know. This is an urban elite person. That's absolutely wrong. I mean, I can give any Malayali a run for their money in terms of <laughs> whatever it is. Yeah, Malayali norms and everything. I think let's observe decency. Let's behave like civilized be beings when we have um, a, a debate. You might not agree with a person's point of view. It might be against your political ideology. It may be against your religious belief, whatever. But that is no way to behave like... A, a, a monster, a beast, or as a misogynistic person. Uh, I, I, I book, like, eating wasp, like, you have written about this. You have a social media or you attack in a petita. Um, I'm going to talk specifically each um, if you have a reward is cherry a good tigalum, strigalum, a kid in the very end to attack a face in more. Our road under the Kendana Paranola as a seasoned writer. Yan Urukaria Parillo Ningala Talarida that uh, in the Ilum Eirth Adu Ulli Verna, Adu Namaka Deva Tenda Uru and the Varia Uru. Uh, it's a blessing. So you cannot toy with it and you can't let the external world take it away from you. Uh, just ignore it and continue to write the way you want to write, but write with honesty and write responsibly. That is not what writing should be about. Writing should be about because you have something important to share with the world. And it could be a point of view, it can be, um, uh, you know, about something, it can be whatever. Pesha, it has to have its certain weightage, which is what is all that I think any writer should be thinking about. For instance, among your characters, uh, one of the characters I am very fond of is Idris. I think he is just fascinating. And um, uh, given Kerala's composition, you know, it's a lovely, lovely uh, gem of a novel, historical fiction. Angana Anita Kedinglu Mangana characters no Pratega Valsali Mul Pratega Iperta Bookila, Anita Mistress Lady and the characters are Idilikari one the tunda eating was pillar. Angane Edingli Moke Uri characters no da Pratega Valsali Mo, Snehamo, a Lingle Aware on the Gude Punar Jenny Pikan and Tona Runda. Um Angana uh Valsalian Tona character on a common mistress. Um, because I have a artistic point of view and a common present. But I don't think Tony is very obsessive. I don't think he is very obsessive. I don't think he is I think it's also it's very hard. Because there are many characters. But Idris is another character that I completely love. Um, as a character that I've created. Uh, the other important thing that I think um, I, I, I think I'd like a reader to know is that Ella characters lim either nyan create the characters lim alla characters some cheetah characters lim ella tilim end or chari or amsham dao. Adonde ni ke ella rodam equal and da parias nehom valselio mukkanda. Veshe adhe bolle avaru dalle vairagio um deshio mukkanda um. So it's a bit of a monument to my own vanity because in every <laughs> character there's a tiny bit of me in there. So yeah. And uh, how do you write as a writer? Do you write? Because I found that you still write with a pen. Do you still continue writing with a pen? Yeah. I do. I and still uh, write with a pen. And how's your handwriting like? Very good. good. Very oh, good. I think okay. I can be called uh, alternate profession as I can be called to write certificates now. You know, because I have a proper copper plate to write. And um, yeah, so I write longhand. Uh, I'm not, I mean, I'm very, very tech savvy and everything, but it's just that I like the process of writing longhand. Mm -hmm. And it gives me a great sense of being viscerally attached to my, uh, you know, uh, characters, which I don't get with uh, a key keyboard, really. Mm -hmm. When you write, is it? And um, you also, uh, one of your screenplays has uh, won an award for you. Malayalathil endu gunda anita angane aarim approachiyar illa anita anita books cinema akana ita. 
ഇത്രയും നല്ല അഡാപ്റ്റ് ചെയ്യാൻ പറ്റുന്ന നോവൽസ് ആണ് ദർ ഇസ് എവറി തിങ് ഇൻ ഇറ്റ് ആക്ച്വലി അങ്ങനെ ആരെങ്കിലും വന്നിട്ടുണ്ടോ ഓ യു കീപ്പിംഗ് ഇൻ എ സീക്രട്ട് നോ 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 ധാരാളം ആൾക്കാർ വരും അതേ സ്പീഡിൽ തന്നെ തിരിച്ചു പോവുകയും ചെയ്യും അത് അതെനിക്കറിയില്ല എന്തുകൊണ്ടാണ് അന്ന് പ്രോബ്ലി മേ ബി ബിക്കോസ് ഇറ്റ്സ് നോട്ട് സിനിമാറ്റിക് എനഫ് ഓർ മേ ബി ദ സബ്ജക്ട് ഇസ് നോട്ട് കമേഴ്സ്യൽ എനഫ് അതായിരിക്കും എനിക്കറിയില്ല അത് ലോഡ് ഓഫ് പീപ്പിൾ ഹു അപ്രോച്ച് മീ ഫോർ വേരിയസ് ബുക്സ് ഓഫ് മൈൻഡ് and um, or even ask me if i could do an independent project with them and so on but at some point obviously i think that's the world of cinema you know i mean you have to chase and i'm not somebody who tends to chase on projects and stuff because i'm busy with my own writing so if somebody comes to me and then they take it up and start taking it to the next level then it happens but i there have been umpteen offers but like i said verum poolum okka kaliju pettanu endha venal mala pole എന്താണ് വെൻ ഹൗ ഡു യു ഫൈൻ റൈറ്റിംഗ് ലിബറേറ്റിംഗ് അനിത ദാറ്റ്സ് വൺ ഓഫ് ദ യു നോ ഇറ്റ് സേസ് ക്രിയേറ്റിംഗ് പ്രിസർവിംഗ് ആൻഡ് ലിബറേറ്റിംഗ് ഹൗ ഡു യു ഫൈൻ റൈറ്റിംഗ് എ ലിബറേഷൻ ഓ ദോ ഹൗ ഡു യു ലിബറേറ്റ് ദ റൈറ്റർ ഫ്രം വാട്ട് യു ഹവ് ഡൺ ബിഫോർ സോ ഐ തിങ്ക് വൺ ഓഫ് ദ തിങ്സ് ഇസ് ദാറ്റ് ഐ തിങ്ക് ദ റൈറ്റർ കെൻ നോട്ട് എവർ എവർ ബി കംപ്ലൈസൻ്റ് അബൌട്ട് വാട്ട് ദിയർ റൈറ്റിംഗ് ആൻഡ് ഹൗ ദിയർ റൈറ്റിംഗ് um because if you're just going to be cloning what you've written once then you have lost your identity as a writer you liberate your identity as a writer when a you are able to push the boundaries you know raise the uh, level a little higher for you each time and secondly i think it's also about um identifying a theme which is not um common place which is not about your comfort zone area you know you need to step out of things and step into areas which you have nothing to do in the real world with apo i think that's when the writer comes into herself or himself when you start plumbing areas that you have otherwise no reason to be in so that liberation is both a physical um, activity as well as a mental uh, challenge and for me as a writer i know that when i write i'm at who i am i know who i am as a person if you ask me now who i am i can just give you my biographical details but when i write i have a clear sense of myself and that is what makes it liberating for me and i think in for many writers ideally that is where they should be pitching to reach at you know that if you can know yourself as a person uh, as a as a writer as a part of the human race then that itself is the most um, priceless possession that you have and i think you also kind of uh, reached out to young writers you have a mentoring workshop called anita's attic can you let tell us something about it i'm sure there are lot of budding writers in this group to oru vaadu perku sondamaya pustakam ezhudana they have that novel in their head that they want to write endani writers workshop il endanu cheyina it's more a mentorship program than a writers workshop mentorship program na varaimbo what i do is i work with writers i mean unpublished or published writers ബേസിക്കലി ഇപ്പം ഞാൻ എഴുതാൻ തുടങ്ങുമ്പോൾ വല്ലാതെ ഐ ഫെൽറ്റ് വെരി ബിക്കോസ് ഐ ഡെൻ കം ഫ്രം എൻ അക്കഡമിക് ബാക്ക്ഗ്രൗണ്ട് ആൻഡ് ഐ കെയിം ഫ്രം ദ വേൾഡ് ഓഫ് ഗ്ലിറ്റ്സ് അഡ്വർടൈസിങ് ആൻഡ് ഐ ഐ ഡെൻ ഹാവ് ഫാമിലി ഓർ ഫ്രണ്ട്സ് ഹു വർ ഇൻ ദാറ്റ് സ്പേസ് സോ ഐ ഫൗണ്ട് ഇറ്റ് വെരി ഐസൊലേറ്റിംഗ് യു നോ ഐ ഫൗണ്ട് ദാറ്റ് അപ്പാർട്ട് ഫ്രം ജയന്ത് മൈ ഫ്രണ്ട് ദർ വിസ് നോ ബഡി എൽസ് ദൈ കുഡ് ടോക്ക് ടു അബൌട്ട് മൈ റൈറ്റിംഗ് ആൻഡ് ഐ ഫൗണ്ട് ദാറ്റ് ദർ വിസ് നോ place for me to discuss books and or oh, see now we have lot of online things happening which you, where you yeah. can do all this but when i started writing there was none of that and i realized that you know i mean i'm sure all writers know that it's a very lonely existence and sometimes you just need somebody to just lean on gently not too much but lean on gently and that uh, is what i try and provide with the mentorship program where the writers come and i choose a few writers every year and work with them on their uh, project which is a real project which is, could be a novel it could be a short story collection it could be a children's book all the genres that i have worked in and uh, i take them through the process and they have somebody to sound them off somebody to breathe down their neck somebody to critique what they are doing so at the end of 12 weeks they pretty much have an idea of how to take it to the next level So, and then of course um i try and you know connect them to agents and publishers and stuff like that i mean like you say i can take the horse to the water okay. but thereafter it's <laughs> they <have to> <laughs> yeah they have to drink it you do some at the indian writing in uh, in english especially with the uh, you know the award going for english writing and so on um, there are lot of indian women who are writing and they've never had it so good before writing in english writing in many regional languages uh what is your take on that 
ഇത്രയും സ്ത്രീകൾ പലതരം ജോണർ എഴുതുന്നവരുണ്ട് ചിക്ലെറ്റ് ഉണ്ട് യു നോ ദെരി ഡിസ്മിസ് ബട്ട് സ്റ്റിൽ ദി ആർ റൈറ്റിംഗ് ഗ്രാഫിക് നോവൽസ് ഉണ്ട് ഓൾ കൈൻഡ്സ് ഓഫ് Uh, what do you feel about it and uh, does it fill you with optimism and what is your take so, on it so i think yeah this is a good and bad side to it one of course is that it's wonderful that you know there are so many new voices emerging and that they are finding publishers who want to publish them and so readers get to read all these uh, new and interesting voices the flip side to it is also that you see a lot of rubbish being published and some of these rubbish is um, it just brings down the i think the literary quotient to some extent where people think that oh and and these are the ones who get these um you know instant recognition and fame and everything and so a lot of young writers think that that's the path to follow because it's easier i mean um when you're writing literary fiction or when you're writing something that's very intensely research driven there is a lot of work involved where is uh, i i'm not being dismissive of chiclet i love reading chiclet too so i'm saying that you know when you just write of one of those uh, sappy soppy Uh, romances then uh, and obviously there's a lot of readership because all of us like you and I also probably read our mills and boon when we were growing up and uh, there is a ready market there for that but you can't just feed the market what they want you i think should give the market try and make them read better things so there is a kind this is what i meant by saying that you know there is responsibility in the with the writer too um so that's all that i would say that you know i think I, it's wonderful there is so much happening it's wonderful that india is reading so much um we are supposed to be one of the biggest markets now and it's wonderful really but i i just wish that we can up our literary quotient a bit more um on that note i think can we leave the floor open for questions yeah so arkingilum chodyangal choikkanundo ആക്ച്വലി ഇത്രയും പുസ്തകങ്ങളെ പറ്റി ഇവിടെ പറഞ്ഞെങ്കിലും അനിത നായർ എന്നുള്ള പേരിനോട് ചേർത്ത് നമ്മൾ ആദ്യം വായിച്ച പുസ്തകത്തിനെ പറ്റി ഒന്നും പറഞ്ഞില്ല ലേഡീസ് കുപ്പെ ഇപ്പോഴും ദ ലാസ്റ്റ് ടൈം വെൻ ഐ റിവ്യൂ യുവർ ഈറ്റിംഗ് വാസ് ഐ വാസ് ടെല്ലിംഗ് സംബഡി അബൌട്ട് ഇറ്റ് ആൻഡ് ഐ സെറ്റ് ഹോ അനിത നായർ ഐ ഹവ് റെഡ് എ ലേഡീസ് കുപ്പ് ഐ ലവ് ദറ്റ് ബുക്ക് വിറ്റ് ദാറ്റ് ബുക്ക് ആക്ച്വലി യു നോ ഇറ്റ് റിമെയിൻസ് ഇൻ മോർ മെമ്മറീസ് ദൻ ദ ലേറ്റർ ബുക്സ് എന്ന് എനിക്ക് തോന്നിയിട്ടുണ്ട് ആൻഡ് ക്യാൻ യു ടെൽ എ സംതിങ് അബൌട്ട് why you wrote a book i mean that was a pattern of writing a, a sort of uh, story that wasn't actually being written about women traveling out together oru bold theme aayirunnu endu parayan when at the time when it came out nobody was writing about these things so can you tell us a little about ladies coupe and how it was born and um, ladies coupe don't exist now yeah, we don't so have a coupe it doesn't now. exist one a so obviously you immediately know it's dated to some extent because of that but uh, i i guess for me you know initially it began with uh, there was this uh, if you went into a railway station earlier i'm not talking about now but earlier you would find a, a line that says ladies senior citizens and handicapped people you know and that used to make me really angry because i said fine i understand you know an elderly person probably needs can't stand for too long or somebody who has a certain handicap might again not be able to stand in a particular line for too long because our railway lines are very i mean queues are very long so um but why a woman and then uh, uh, adding insult to injury was um you would find uh, that the woman was never there by herself there would always be a man so she's just a prop so there would be a father or a husband uh, brother son whatever standing there and she's just a prop and he's going to do the ticketing so he, she's just occupying a place and that made me think about wanting to write a book about what is a woman's identity you know how does a woman know who she is where does she, where does she locate herself so it began with a kind of um deep seated rage about the way the world saw women especially in that period of time which is i think the late 90s and um, which when i was coming into my own as a woman too because earlier than that i was too young and later than that i would have become a little more blase about it but i was at that right age where i was getting angry about it and it just simmered in my head eventually it became this book angry young woman <laughs> uh hi uh, i'm chris uh I'd like to ask you two questions. One is uh does reading make a writer? What kind of books you read? That's the first part. Second, you were you were talking about the misogynistic uh point of view. But when I approach with my books, my first book was launched, there was another woman's chiclet book being released that had more audience and more people and more media covering whereas nobody coming to because it's a man's book. 
and publishers, I send them my book. It usually takes at least two hours to read a book. I get a reply within about five or three minutes saying that, no, this is not fit publishing. So uh, the only option left is to blog and maybe I become a hater of writing or something. But I didn't do that. I'm still trying to find publishers who will listen to a writer. So uh, I want to know how to approach a publisher. <laughs> so, right. Uh, first question, um, I mean, first part of your question about, uh, yes, of course, I think reading is supremely important because it is where you learn. You know, you learn to distinguish styles, you learn to distinguish voices, you learn to distinguish themes. All of it is very, very important. Uh, and with every book you read, I, I, I keep telling people that, you know, it's not about the author, it's about the book. You know, every, there could be a fabulous author who could write a terrible book or, or vice versa. So every book you read, you learn something new. You learn something new that adds to your technique, it adds to your style, it adds to your vocabulary, to your knowledge base, whatever. So I think reading is supremely important. Any writer who tells me that she can't read or he can't read needs to go and self-examine themselves and ask themselves, why am I writing? Um, second part of it, um, you know, publishing, unfortunately, much as I would like to, I mean, uh, imagine otherwise, is after all a business. It is a business. It is a commercial enterprise. Um, and we don't live in a country uh, like, say, probably um, in, in Scandinavia and many parts of Europe where you have writer grants and publishing grants, where publishers have the funds who provided funds to publish um, not so mainstream writing as well. So what happens is, uh, obviously, even like I was saying earlier to Saraswati, that um, a chiclet book, no matter who the author is, a chiclet or a ladlet book, um, obviously finds more readers because people don't want readers. Most readers, like moviegoers or uh, music and dance uh, watchers, don't want to make an effort to understand something that is complex. It's easier for them to just read something and there is no synapse between reading and uh, imbibing. It just happens because it's all commonplace kind of things, commonplace themes. So obviously there are more readers, you know, for those, that kind of writing. And publishers obviously need, uh, they, have to, they have a balance sheet as well to look after. So they end up, you know, uh, uh, pushing their uh, commercial titles in, with, with a greater flourish rather than say their you know, literary fiction or the esoteric side of their publishing. Um, so naturally, so, so it's like a horrible uh, and um, vicious cycle that one feeds off the other. And so when you have like, uh, if you have like a very popular, uh, uh, you know, writer, a commercial fiction writer, uh, the media is going to turn up there because they know that more people are going to read the newspaper that day because of that. It's not because it's you or there's nothing personal I would like to think that give media the benefit of doubt but it's basically that it's unfortunately the nature of the world we live in and uh, how do you find a publisher I all I have to say is just keep trying you know I mean you cannot be disheartened um, there's so many people I mean I, I had a magical start but thereafter my books have been rejected so, you know, it doesn't uh, always mean that just because you've been published once, you'll constantly get published. There are Booker Prize winners who have been then published by tiny publishing houses simply because they didn't write the kind of Booker winning book that they had written the next time around. So all I would say that is that please don't lose hope and forget the rest of the, you know, all the drama around it and just keep at your writing and hopefully it'll find its place. What's your perception regarding children as characters? I mean, in your traveling writing? Um, so I write for children, but when I write my travel, um, I somehow don't seem to have any child in it, except for my son who would come in briefly and disappear. But the reason being, I'm a solitary traveler, pretty much. Um, now, in the last uh, few years, when I have traveled, I have traveled with my grown-up son, um, because 
but again, I prefer being a solitary traveler. So which is why, I mean, I think maybe you've just set me up on a whole new path. Maybe I should do a travel with a child and see how it changes travel writing. Morning, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, you said about uh, Raja Lakshmi's uh, life and all those things. When I read the English translation, I re I've read both Malayalam and English, and in the English translation of The Path and Many Shadows, uh, in the introductory part, there is a comment that, uh, as Raja Lakshmi said, uh, like, uh, I, if I live, I will write. So, if I write, I will hurt many. So, let me live. That's the note that she left, it seems. So, um, from that sort of social condition, now you are sitting in such an international f film festival as a successful, celebrated writer. So, what do you feel and how the earlier history, the women writers, how they influenced you? I'm in interested in knowing that. So, if you read, um, you know, there's uh, this wonderful uh, translator called Geeta Krishnanguti, and she brought out this book um, called, um, which is about Lalitambika Antarjanam's writings, okay? And in that, one of the uh, passages is about where this daughter talking to the mother and how the mother stopped talking to her because she chose to write. Um, so, I, you know, this has always existed, that there will always be some kind of um, um, censorship inflicted on them. Um, it could be societal, it could be um, establishment, it could be whatever, but uh, there will be always some form of censorship, even to this day, when you have women writing about certain subjects. Uh, I, you know, I have been asked so often about what I write. And I've been asked questions like, doesn't it bother you that your mother might read it and that kind of thing. Um, or I've seen co comments where you know, somebody said, you know, I was very embarrassed because my mother was reading the same book or my father was reading the same book. And I keep thinking that you know, nothing much has changed. You know? I mean, yes, in, in 1960s or in 1940s, um, it was very different, even in the 1970s and 1990s. But this change of uh, acceptance is, I think, very superficial. Yes, on the one level, um, you know, yes, I'm able to sit, out, sit, sit up here and talk about my writing without feeling that I'm going to have to bear the consequences of it. But at the same time, there is a point where you know that there is an invisible world out there who can attack you. So all that, uh, that has changed is that the visible world um, is, is not just that that's attacking you now, which is what happened in that generation. It's also this invisible world. So I think writers actually perform a great feat of courage, women writers, when they actually choose to write what they really want to write about. Uh, and that is all that can keep them going, no matter what the generation is.